so I was saying that I had a lot of conversations with people and they were very interesting, travel, books, stuff that, but I thought, isn't there something that as elders, we're sort of meant to be doing to somehow encourage and support the next generation? And at that question, it didn't really plague me, but it stayed with me. And eventually in a conversation with a friend, who was interviewing me as I was becoming the board president of this same environmental organization, what my aspirations were. And in a kind of offhand way, I said, you know, I'm also really interested in encouraging elders to kind of reclaim an elder wisdom role in society. And she just really pinged to that and wrote a grant. And this was about 2017, I think. And that was the beginning of the elder circle and the work that we've been doing. So I think what I will do is just say that that has gathered people around a kind of core elder circle community. Uh, and over time, one of the things that emerged out of it was the idea to encourage elders to think about a legacy. And the reason for thinking about a legacy is that when people think to themselves, well, what do I want to pass forward to, you know, younger generations? Uh, sometimes it's for family, sometimes it's for their community, and sometimes it's volunteer work that they're doing in the community and so on. It tends to get people a little more in that groove of thinking, gee, I really am an elder. And uh, I really do want to leave something behind or pass something forward from my experience. And not in a vain way, but in a way that really honors our role in terms of supporting next generations. And um, in fact, some of the people that are in the room were members of that uh, uh, legacy making course that, that we did. And I appreciate your, your um, participation. That proved to be uh, quite a rewarding experience for many of the people that were involved. Um, and we kind of have moved to the next level, which is to say, well, there's a lot of, uh, of elders that are volunteering in organizations of all different kinds in the community. Maybe there's something that we can upskill them in a way to bring more of their elder knowledge and elder skills. And, and I don't want to say to, to go into an organization just as a volunteer, because volunteers are just so hugely important in, in the charitable sector. But I believe elders have special skills and special, sometimes very specialized knowledge. Uh, but, you know, there are things that happen to our brains as we age, and we actually have a, a, a more holistic perspective. We're said to be happier than any other, any other age group and, uh, and often, you know, have a, a, a fair bit of interest in what is coming next and how we can support. So um, I feel there may be things that we can do. So we have organized something called Being a Guiding Elder for or an organization, or it's the Organizational Guiding Elder Program. And just this morning, and I think Ruth and Paula were both there this morning, weren't you? And um, uh, what we're doing right now is piloting some of the modules that we want to have in that program. In this case, it was a conversation with young people. And I would really love Ruth or Paula, if either of you would like to just say a, a, a sentence or two about how you've experience that this morning for me i thought it was a wonderful experience paula you look like you're ready sure um yes i found this morning um really a um a very inspiring um presentations that were given by some of uh, i think some of the young people um and their enthusiasm and their you know um was very touching about uh, some of the things that are, you know, important to me um, mm -hmm. as well. And they really wanted the elders to become part of the discussion, which, you know, makes one feel very welcomed. Um, 
And so, yeah, and so Ruth was there too. So maybe Ruth could say something. Oh, I just echo your sentiments. Uh, yeah, very inspiring, uh, great bridging opportunity because if we're not active in either a classroom or, or in the community, we don't engage very easily with people of other, with intergenerational um, conversations. So very inspiring, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you much for that. Much. I'm glad that was very much my experience too, that it was very inspiring. It met all of my expectations and then some, and the elders that were there were also, I think really heartwarmed by it. You know, there were a lot of expressions of the, the connection that people felt. I mean, the room just stayed with us for two hours and mm -hmm. everybody seemed to be really engaged and interested. So I think we have a successful module. I'll just quickly say we have a Souder professor who's going to do an organizational behavior module for us. We have a professional group that's going to do the diversity, inclusion, equity, justice module. And I'm working very hard and think I'm going to be able to pull together an Indigenous elders panel that will come and talk about what it's like to be in a society where elders are valued and young people go to them, you know, just routinely to be supported and, and have advice. So I'll keep you updated on that. I hope that's going to happen in March. And the, um, the course will happen in 2023 when we find out if we've got the funds for it, as always. There is a matter of having to wait until the, uh, the grant comes through. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't take more than five minutes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That, that was fantastic. Um, and so the impression is that if we didn't go to today's module, um, which sounded so interesting, we could still go to some of the later modules. Yes. And there's a communications module. And and today's module was videotaped, oh, which good. I think mm -hmm. that I could get permission. He's <laughs> really keen to see it. Mm -hmm. I, I think you would just be so moved by these young mm -hmm. people but also the interaction of the group with yes yeah. please please do send that to us and also thank you so much for um sending this information to the group at large and i encourage anyone else who has um volunteer opportunities that come along to either contact me or to just write to the group um you just have to copy to all on on my emails um i sometimes when i get quite a few volunteer opportunities um, I try to put them all together into one email, but, you know, again, if you want to write to people directly, that's, that's fine. That would be fine. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, Ruth, you're on next. Yeah, today I just want to talk to you about sponsoring refugee families. Mm -hmm. I'm involved in many other volunteer or, or activities as well, but this is, has a particular passion for me. So in 2017, I sponsored the first family uh, from Iraq. It was Basel Nihal and their four children of various ages. And it came through a, a request from a friend I met uh, who was from Iraq and had settled here. And he said, Ruth, would you be interested in sponsoring a family there? Uh, I, I could help you. I can assist you with documents. I can show you how to do this. I knew nothing about it. So that was my first immersion. That in 2017, that family has become very dear friends. Their door is always open for tea. They make fabulous baklava and too much mm. food usually, but it's been a rich relationship. The other family is Kurdish. Um, there was the um, uh, Syrian Kurdish family, Mohammed and Aisha and their four sons in 2017 as well uh, that I sponsored. Now I, I knew more about the process. And so I worked with them, but there is, it's one thing to sponsor them, fill out reams of documents. They're not easy to fill out. IRCC in Ottawa is complex uh, and it's a long wait, wait two or three years from the doc, signing the documents to finally meeting them at the airport. So it is a long process, but one encourage you don't, the rewards are, are worth the wait. So the Syrian Kurdish family, um, I'm still involved. There's ongoing advocacy for their son, Hikmat. When they were being chased out of their village in the Kurdish area of Syria, 
the uh, Daesh uh, was was advancing so rapidly they couldn't get all their family members together. So they were separated from their 14 year old son, Hekmat, and they still are not reunited with him since 2017. He fled by himself, he and his cousin crossed the mountains on their own. His cousin was, was captured by Daesh and um, killed. So Hekmat, in extreme trauma, wandered over the mountains and eventually got to Turkey and then to Germany, where he still is today. So he's now no longer 14, but I'm still advocating with members of parliament and others trying to get him into Canada. It's extremely difficult. Long story, but that breaks my heart, but I still am committed to trying to do this. I'm also providing monthly support for a sister and her family in Turkey who've been in a Turkish refugee camp. So every month I raise funds for them. Uh, then there's the Ukrainian refugees. Oksana Durishina from Ukraine with her three teens um, was the first to cross, to come into Canada and come to YVR uh, from Ukraine. That was February 24th. So um, border, border Patrol and, and border agents did not know what to do with her. She was breaking, breaking ice constantly, pioneering her way through. So that has been uh, very rewarding to assist her, including the desperate phone call from the airport. Ruth, they don't know who I am. None of, I don't have any paperwork. Can you come and talk to them? So it's that kind of drama that's heartbreaking. So she arrived in February of last year. Finally, December of last year, her husband was able to join her. The only way he could join her as a 34 year old healthy young man was to escape. So he fled, he, he went south and then east into Russia proper, then across to the Northern part of Russia through Norway and then down into Poland all by on foot and, and hiding from both Ukrainian military agents and Russian military agents who would all have loved to have him in their military, of course. He's here now. Yes, yeah, so the family is together. So they need ongoing support, trauma, counseling. Uh, they have jobs, they're eager to work. They have their uh, permanent resident status. They have benefits like dental, medical, which all requires volunteer help uh, to fill out the forms and understand them in English. That's just Oksana's story. Then um, presently there's a Kado family in Istanbul. They escaped Iraq, mm -hmm. escaped Daesh as well. They have been in Istanbul for eight years with their three children. Uh, they're not allowed to work because they're refugees. They're not allowed to uh, attend school, not allowed any privileges and no residency at all. So eight years is a long time. They have had no hope, but now that I've been willing to say, okay, I will fill out the documents. I will contact an NGO. I will work with you. Now they say, it doesn't matter, Ruth, if it takes three more years, we have hope. Mm -hmm. so that's my present, yeah. uh, present um, involvement. The, how I got involved, I walked into an immigration office in Vancouver and just said, I've just retired, I'm emeritus now. I would like to volunteer to work with refugees. What can I do? And they connected me to the Kurdish family, said they need settlement help as well. And now uh, I continue to get requests from friends of the Iraqi and Syrian families asking to be sponsored. But the key to sponsorship is you need to work ideally with an SAH, that is a sponsorship agreement holder with an NGO. That's the quickest and most efficient way to do it. So to have contact with an SAH, if, if you yourself do the same thing that I did, just go to the Welcome House on Victoria Drive or contact, I have information at the, at the end here. Uh, if it's Ukraine, there's a United for Ukraine, you can call 211, how can I help? Start asking, they will tell you about uh, partners, SAHs. They will guide you through the process. You don't have to do this alone. So that was my initial. Um, and now as I move forward with, with NGOs uh, and filling out the documents, I now 
finally know how to do it, but there still are glitches. Uh, one other quick point, if you cannot find a partner to form an SAH, a sponsorship agreement holder, you can form a group of five people, each one um, validating their having a criminal record check and assuring immigration services that they will have the funding to support this family when they arrive in Canada. That's another way to do it. It's all overwhelming, but there's a lot of very willing people at the agencies who are very helpful. So I hope that's uh, inspired you a little and uh, hope you, you can uh, uh, share or at least hear my passion, how meaningful this has been for me to connect with people from all over the world and how rich it's been. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, both of these have been fabulous uh, presentations. Uh, does anybody have any questions uh, that you want to ask now? You know, pardon, somebody have a question? You know, one thing that I may ask you all to do um, is to just perhaps send me a brief, not, not I mean, we're, we're recording this, but just like a brief description of kind of what's next, like maybe um, Carol, kind of what the next module is or how they, it's, it's how everyone can get involved. And Ruth, what you just described was quite involved, um, but maybe just the, the bare bones, this is who you, this is whom you contact, you know, kind of thing. And I will put all of this together and send it out along with, with the recording to okay. everyone. Okay, that's great. Peter, um, I think you're gonna tell us about a university, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I'm coming to that. I just to pick up on, on uh, Ruth's point, uh, we've also been a part of a, a group of families that sponsored a Syrian Kurdish family. And it's been very gratifying to see them thriving. They came here a few years ago before COVID and have done very well. And they've asked us to sponsor more members of their family, which we're working on. And I do uh, appreciate that it takes time. It's been several years, but um, things are in progress. Um, so that's one thing that I'm volunteering with. The other thing, uh, which I've been doing for about 30 years, is uh, working as volunteer for scientists and innovators in the schools to, uh, through Science World, where I go and talk to school classes, mostly high school, but sometimes elementary, uh, about careers uh, in uh, academic science, and mostly focusing on health care, because that's what I know. Uh, and most recently, I continue to do that most recently to a class of, of kids at a high school that have pretty severe emotional disturbances. And the teacher told me that none of those kids are going to university. So could you talk about careers that don't require a university education. And so I did. I talked about all the people that worked around me in my career who didn't, many of them didn't go to university, but were nevertheless essential in healthcare. Um, so that's local. Um, at an international level, uh, I, I've been involved with this group called Critical Care Asia Africa since I retired from university. Uh, it's a network of intensive care units in South Asia and Africa funded by the Wellcome Trust, uh, essentially building quality improvement infrastructure uh, for those intensive care units. And this is something that I've, I've been doing in my career. Um, and so I've been helping a group of intensive care units in Kathmandu and then also now in Ghana, uh, mostly online. Um, although I re this led to a, a trip to um, Kathmandu just a few weeks ago, uh, I was invited to speak at a conference there. And while I was there, I extended my trip and met with uh, some of the people I've been working with online. Um, the specific project uh, had to do with uh, evaluating a new form of oxygen therapy and uh, essentially writing a manuscript about this evaluation. Well, while I was there, we finished the manuscript and I'm pleased to, to, to say the manuscript is submitted to a, a, a mainstream journal in critical care. And so um, that will be probably the currency of success of, of that project. Now, also, while I was in Kathmandu, I met with a man named Arjun Karki. Some of you may know that name. Uh, Arjun helped set up a new medical school in, Kath in Kathmandu, actually in Patton, which is the southern part of Kathmandu. And UBC was very much involved in, this, in the establishment of that medical school. It's called mm -hmm. Patton Academy of Health Sciences. Well, Arjun has moved on from that position, and uh, he's now working with uh, a group that is trying to establish a new undergraduate university in Nepal. Um, university education in Nepal has been very traditional, very uh, single discipline focused, uh, quite narrow in the focus in terms of what students learn. Uh, and 
really, um, there still is a large brain drain in Nepal. People go elsewhere to go to university. This University of Nepal is trying to create a much more modern thinking university, interdisciplinary, and that prepares uh, students to be very active participants in the development of their country, such that they don't feel the need to go elsewhere and not come back. Um, Nancy kindly uh, attached a description of that, uh, the, that proposal for that university to one of our previous emails. And uh, I would welcome anybody who has any interest or experience in doing this. What they're really looking for is people that might actually, first of all, be interested in advising on the development of the university, but also uh, being uh, volunteer teachers for blocks of courses. They're planning to have shorter blocks of courses rather than whole year. Uh, so to actually come there and to uh, to teach. Now, the university is not operating yet. They're still in the development phases, but they're certainly looking for people to uh, to help out. So maybe I'll just pause there and um, see if there's any questions or comments. Put my name on your list. <laughs> I'd like okay. to volunteer. Um, Carolyn, can I ask uh, if uh, you could send me an email, maybe just with yeah. a short uh, bio of like what you what your background is and what you That's might right. be willing to contribute. I will, my, email, my email is on the list of emails with uh, with Nancy's uh, mail yeah. Thank you. Peter, you know, probably, I, I know. Oh, sorry, sorry, Judith, Go, please. Well, I was just gonna say, Peter, you probably know that Bob Armstrong was the Dean of Medical School in Kenya. And the in medical schools meant to be community-based, so it was a brand new idea for Kenya. And I think he learned a lot about starting off from scratch, um, but he's also in touch with the other deans of medical schools across Africa, and he might have some thoughts for you. Bob Armstrong. Yes, we were. I've been in touch with Bob. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I was just gonna say, Carol, Carol Lynn, um, you, um, I noticed that you are willing to sign up for quite a few things here. <laughs> yeah. you know, a note to Ruth, um, can one contribute in regard to lifelong learning? Uh, and so that's mm -hmm. for those of you who are sponsoring um, mm -hmm. refugees, are there other ways to participate in helping them with services and lifelong learning is a, is a great way to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and yeah, language, uh, conversational English. Uh, okay. Just English understanding the one. Canadian culture. Yes, it's it absolutely. Okay. And you also mentioned an important one. I don't know if there are people in counseling here, but um, you mentioned counseling of because of the trauma that they've mm -hmm. um, lived through. Yes, I I I don't attempt to do that myself. I do direct them to to trauma counselors, and Immigration Services has uh, references. For, for that qualified professional counselors. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, well, this is fabulous. Uh, next up is Lynn. Okay. Lynn, how do you say your last name? Well, I just say Youngblood. It's a Dutch yeah. name. You meant to say Youngblood, but when I say that, people don't understand it or they don't know how to spell <laughs> it. And <laughs> so you say Youngblood. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> So I've been involved in English conversation classes for those learning English for about eight years. And through COVID, we did it on Zoom, but now we meet in person at a church on the UBC campus. And most of the students live in that area. Some are spouses of students. There are three levels, beginners, intermediate, and advanced. I teach an advanced class and I develop the outline and send it to the students before the class so they can think about it. And the student, students really love it. They form relationships among themselves. And you can see over time how their confidence and ability to speak English um, grows and improves. And then another activity like Ruth and Peter, I have been involved in refugees in the past was through the Immigrant Services Society host family program. But the other day or at the beginning of the year, a people who had sponsored a refugee asked me to help because she had academic interests. And she was from, she's from Iran and she had been a midwife. But now 
in Iran, she had done eight years of research, but she had no training in research, but she had done, she has eight publications and three of them, she's the primary author. So she's actually very accomplished and very, very interested in research. And so I set about trying to help her find what she could do, like a master's degree at UBC. So the one that we decided on was on the children's and women's health. And we, she applied to that. But I think at UBC, there are about 100 master's programs. But for some of the programs in health, including this one, you have to have a supervisor before you will be accepted to the program. So she wrote to like 18 supervisors, potential supervisors, and nobody wanted to take her. Mm -hmm. And so it was very disappointing. She's disappointed because now she's applying to do. Um, um, medical office assistant program. But that still is what she wants to do. So I don't know if anybody has ideas about it. But I think what I realized over time was the supervisors want very competent students that can mm -hmm. run their research programs and write publications and do all these things. And, and she wasn't really. at a point where she could do all those things, but she had a lot of potential. So anyway, it was a bit disappointing. Yeah. Whoops. Thank you for that. Um, and I guess that Emeriti can't supervise her, can they? No. I suppose not. All she right. She probably has to have a, somebody who's in the program. Yeah. And yeah. as a main supervisor, you could probably have Emeriti people on your committee. That's mm -hmm. my guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's interesting hearing about uh, so many refugees who are who the Maritai are working with. Um, I recently heard that 10 Afghan young women were admitted into the master's program in engineering at UBC. And, um, you know, they're facing a lot of issues. I mean, now they do have... Um, academic services who are supporting them. Uh, so they don't so much need help with the academic part of it, although I know that there are quite a few engineers here. So um, people from the engineering faculty, so they're presumably that having some mentor, uh, emeritus mentor would be fantastic. Um, but I think they also just need help with just acclimatizing themselves to this new culture uh, and and probably just having someone helping them with their bank accounts or or other kinds of services would be would be really useful. Um, so right within UBC, we have so many students from um, refugee students that we could also be considering. Right. Right. Um, so who's next, Pete? Pete Nelson, you're next on the list. Thank you. Um, I haven't done anything very major uh, as been presented by the other folk in the group, but uh, I've done volunteering for since I retired for a number of different organizations, most recently with Megaphone, you know, which is the on the street newspaper, mm. um, and done a few things with them, uh, along with uh, Mandy, who I think is is here as well. Hi, Mandy. Um, the most important thing, one I did, I think, important is written a bit large, was uh, an organization which I think was called Vancouver Downtown East Side Women's Center. But I never really quite worked out what it's actually, whether it had a formal title different than that. Um, but this was an, an organization which really get pro provided lunches for uh, women, uh, most or many of them who were abused. And I was one of the few men who helped prepare food at the time. And that was quite an interesting experience because one had to be quite careful about how you tried to relate with the women, many of whom had been abused. And the last thing they wanted to do was have anything to do with men. Uh, and I did this about every two weeks for a year and a half or something like that. And by the end, I made one or two small advances in friendships with uh, some of these women you know would actually smile back at me instead of scowl and would actually say hi how are you and things like that so that was quite rewarding um i stopped doing it because uh, the kitchens where we prepared the food the ceiling fell in and was full of asbestos and rats and other things 
Um, so we did it a little bit more by getting food from other places and then just handing it out, you know, uh, at the tables, but um, didn't really do it for me after a while. So I stopped doing that. Um, the other thing I'll mention, which is rather different, and I'm I, a little uncertain about, is something called Global Volunteers. Has anyone come across that? No. Well, I'm not sure. You pay a large sums of money to go somewhere and do some volunteering. Uh, so my wife and I, we went to the Cook Islands and then on to Australia, where we've got relatives. Um, and I, the Cook Islands is a fantastic place to be. Yeah. Um, so by paying, I don't know, something like $5,000, um, we were able to go to the Cook Islands and do a couple of weeks of volunteering and they would feed us and put us up at a little local hotel. And it was great fun. Um, I don't, as I say, I don't know though what the, what the real charity organization would say about Global Volunteers, whether it's considered uh, an acceptable organization to work for. It seemed to be, I mean, everybody I met seemed to be very dedicated to helping. My wife was much more useful than I was because she's a math teacher and she taught uh, grade, you know, nine, tens, elevens, twelves math, where I had no, I have no math experience. So I went to um, a primary school, and they never really quite knew how to use me. So I did some reading stories to some of them, but I didn't know what to do, and they didn't really know what to do. What, how to use me and I think that may be a theme for a lot of volunteer organizations uh, for a lot of charity organizations NGOs and things so they don't really know how to use volunteers particularly if they're not if their volunteers are not coming in with a defined project they want to do so I'd be interested again hearing what other people's experience has been like with volunteers Ruth I thought you must have had to push yourself very hard to get into that didn't you working um, with this Canada and things or not? No, no, not at all. Uh, oh, really? No, I was quite naive <laughs> when I just walked into the, you know, the Welcome Centre on Victoria Drive yeah. and said, um, hi, I've just retired. I'm wondering if uh, I can volunteer in some way to assist refugee families. And uh, that's... The rest of history, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, so as I say, I most recently and still am a bit of volunteering with Megaphone. Uh, everyone there seems to be fantastically enthusiastic and helpful. Interesting, I, while researching this today, earlier today, I came across something called Charity Intelligence Canada. I don't know whether anyone has come across that. Uh, you have Nancy, right? I have, yes, but tell us about it. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, okay. Um, What's interesting is that Megaphone doesn't come up in uh, um, their in Charity Intelligence Canada a list. And it may be because Megaphone is too small an organization and they, they, they really are more interested in, in, in large charities rather than small things like Megaphone. I don't think it's because Megaphone has any thing that worries them but they do give a score so some organizations you know are only get one or two or even less score on their uh, on their list which is sort of interesting and maybe anyone who's not sure what they would like to do uh it might be worth going on to charity intelligence canada and, and just look at their website and see what they have what they think about any charity they think they might be interested in working for um, I think really that's all I want to say. Uh, I think that there are so many things one could do. I personally didn't want to do too much. You know, I, I feel I'd sort of worked hard most of my professional career, as of course of you all you guys, and I'm la intrinsically lazy. So I just uh, uh, <laughs> done odds and ends and bits and pieces um, <laughs> and found it very enjoyable and planned to do more. And I think something like this that helps us all 
be inspired and thoughtful about what volunteering we might do is 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 worth having. Quite how it goes. I'm, I'm from here, Nancy. I'm not sure, but oh, well, I think I think this is great, uh, Pete, because what you're suggesting um, there, that people want to do two different kinds of volunteer work, and one is long term, where you commit yourself to a year or two, and then there you want to be pretty careful about what you get into when you sponsor a refugee. Um, you're making a large commitment. Other people want to do like these one off things. Um, which you're describing, and that's fantastic uh, because there are so many crises going uh, almost every day. There's a new one, and, and some people want to get involved in that. You know, I think I mentioned with Care Canada, we would get involved in like a three-year project um, with women and girls in uh, developing countries, mostly African countries. But, you know, then when Afghanistan happened and the Ukraine crisis and others, you know, we thought, well, do we want to really be doing this long term project? Because we kind of want to jump over to these other ones that are these immediate crises. And um, and so there is this, this real trade off involved when choosing volunteer work. And that's one of the one of the hopes is that we at least talk about enough opportunities that we can find that match. Um, so that's really um, important that you, you raise that. The other thing, just quick, quickly about the um, char uh, Charity Intelligence Network or what, whatever it's called, I, I looked that up just because I was really interested in whether or not there was an organization that sort of scores charities, that if you're thinking of contributing to uh, some charity, what is which ones will give you the biggest you know, bang for your buck, um, which is the best, which are the best investments um, to make. And it was interesting to see that maybe we should ask them to come to our Ooh. group and, and just describe what that's about. And lastly, and importantly, is on February 23rd is our next meeting and Megaphone will be speaking at it. Um, and so and they're, they're a wonderful organization. I'm sure they would score high if they were picked. Probably they are too small. Also, the YWCA is coming and they're extremely enthusiastic. The CEO of that CEO of of that is um, of, of YWCA is going to be joining us um, along with a volunteer uh, director, and they are very excited about coming to our group. So I think with those two two groups, we should have a really interesting meeting. And so that's on February twenty third. Okay, Carol Lynn, um, you're on yeah. next. Yeah, I was saying I'm an outsider, so maybe I should be last. <laughs> Actually, I'm with the Later Life Learning Committee of the uh, National Organization of um, Retired Professors, or what we call the College and University Retirees Association. And so when I first joined them, I thought, boy, you know, they're not, <laughs> they're not doing uh, everything that I'd like to see them to do. And so they asked me, well, what would you like to see? So where did I go? The UBC website, <laughs> your emeritus college. And I met uh, Diane and she gave me so many ideas and now I'm still taking them. And this latest idea of a volunteer group is something that CURAC is thinking about doing. So I'm getting lots of information from you folks to, to share with them. My background, I'm, a reg I'm still a registered nurse and also a sociologist, clinical sociologist, and have been involved with students online from all different countries. But uh, when I got to retire, I wanted to keep contact with students, <laughs> uh, this intergenerational learning kind of thing, and uh, also to keep in touch with some of my peers. So when I got to involved with uh, the university, uh, when I first retired, I wanted to set up a university of the third age, like we have in France. I have dual citizenship, I have so. And so uh, university of the third age. And then when I joined the Emeriti executive, I thought, oh, well, this is sort of like a university of the third age, so I won't bother pursuing that route. But with CURAC, I wanted to see a later life learning group set up, you know, and this whole, you know, uh, what would you say, United Nations has this decade of healthy aging and how do we keep uh, 
people involved. We're not really retired. We're on long-term sabbatical, I tell everyone. So, because actually, when you think of it, we are, you know, all involved in something. So, uh, I did get Curac to set up a later life learning group, and UBC is sharing some of their uh, learning uh, their events and uh, well 18 of the retirees association across Canada so I thought well I better spread this word to Europe because that's that's not happening enough so sure enough and they know about UBC boy and so and your program so just be prepared for more for more uh communication uh my involvement with the Pass It On Network that's organized by a colleague of mine in Paris, France, uh, got me involved with some of the folks still involved in teaching in various African countries, especially Rwanda. So I'm very interested in sharing or, you know, journal work. I'm a editor of a refereed journal, so I'm trying to help people from all different areas of the world get involved in publishing. And you, someone spoke about Turkey, someone spoke about Nepal, <laughs> all of those places I've been in touch. So that's why I'm here. And I certainly commend each of you uh, with the work you're doing. It's absolutely splendid. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful, Carolyn. Thank you so much. You're, you're zooming in from Calgary, right? That's right. That's yeah. where I am based. Oh, Unfortunately, so I wanted I wanted to move to BC, but didn't make it. <laughs> well, um, thank you for joining our group. We really appreciate it. Let's stay in touch about about some of these initiatives you're talking about. That Will do. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So we're doing really well with the timing. We have Paul Steinbach and um, Graham Wynn left. So Paul, do you want to tell us about your adventures? I've unmuted myself. Yeah, I'm just going to talk about uh, a group that I involved with, the Jewish Family Services, and a program called Thriving Seniors. So when I stopped uh, being a clinical neurosurgeon over five years ago, I was still uh, working at UBC with uh, doing research and teaching, but I wanted to start doing a bit of volunteering. I'd been supporting this group called Jewish Family Services with donations on a regular basis. And I thought, well, maybe now I had some extra time, I could uh, work and do something on the ground with the group. So I contacted them and said, is there anything I could do? And they said, yes, what we'd love is for somebody to drive cars and drive a car to deliver food hampers to people on a regular basis. And I said, well, I can't commit to uh, doing this on a regular basis because I'm traveling a lot still, but I could do it uh, occasionally if I'm in town at the time you need help. So they put me down as a relief driver and they would contact me when somebody was not going to be available. And I started doing that, which was uh, pretty straightforward and interesting. Met a few people, felt that I was being helpful. And then they said, well, we need a driver also to take uh, seniors to a lunch once a month where I um, take them there and pick them up at the end of their session. And I said, well, yeah, I could do that too. So I did. And I was amazed with some of the seniors that I had 90 something year old people who were still functioning, living on their own and so on. I went to, took them to lunch. And then I come to pick them up and realize that they were being entertained after lunch by having a movie of some sort. And three times I went and there were three different movies that they were showing to these people of entertainment after lunch. And all of these uh, elderly people were thrilled with this uh, event that they would go to. And then I thought, you know, I would offer to... Uh, come and uh, give a presentation after their lunch on travel photography or something like that, which I like to do. And maybe that would be different from just having a, another old movie shown. But then COVID started. 
as soon as COVID started, I said, well, I'm a senior. I really uh, can't uh, go uh, taking food hampers, going into other people's houses and so on. So I stopped the driving. They stopped this program, but I contacted the CEO of the organization and said, you know, I'd be quite interested in giving some presentations to seniors online by Zoom, or if you can arrange it, now that we can't do it locally. And I sent them examples of some presentation. And then a few months later, I got a call saying, we've got a grant to set up a new program for seniors. Uh, would you be interested in being on the leadership team for uh, setting this program up? since you seem to be interested in this. And I said, sure. And so uh, we had a small leadership team and uh, we were in charge of actually putting a name to the program, which we ended up calling Thriving Seniors, planning a program with uh, uh, two sessions every month for these seniors. And we uh, have put that in place. It's been going now for uh, into the second year. And I've had the opportunity to give some uh, presentation to this group, in addition to participating in other uh, people's presentations. So it's been quite rewarding, and I've got to be involved more with Jewish Family Services and the Food Security Program. I am a gardener. I, that was one of my major interests. I grew a lot of vegetables. My wife was always telling me I grew too much. I said, not a problem anymore. <laughs> I talked to the food security people at Jewish Family Services. Would you be prepared to accept extra vegetables? They said, we'd love to. So, uh, my wife now is quite happy with me. I grow <laughs> many vegetables I feel like growing. And when we have more than I can use, and instead of giving them just to the neighbors, which I used to do, I take them down to the Jewish uh, Family Services food bank. And they're very happy to send them out in their food hampers on a regular basis. So for me, it's been very, uh, not a lot of hard work. I didn't want to get occupied too much. I wanted to leave time for relaxation, for travel, working with the Emeritus College, which I got involved with uh, at around the same time. And I uh, didn't want to be overwhelmed because one of the things that I was told before, whether we get ready to retire is that uh, people will ask you to do all kinds of things now that they know you're retired, uh, be careful. Uh, do not accept too many things. Uh, you'll soon find it's too much. So right now I'm comfortable and uh, this uh, has been helpful. And I'm getting to the point where I feel that maybe I've been with the organization on the ground long enough that I could be of value if I was on the board of the organization. I didn't want to be on the board of any such organization until I knew more about what they were actually doing. But for me, uh, supporting financially and helping an organization that's devoted to helping the local people in need in our community was very important. That was one of the things I wanted to do. So I've done it. Great. That's a great story. Um, what I like about it is just the way you evolved within the organization. You did <coughs> thing and that led to another and another. And now you are actually thinking of joining the, you know, the management board, uh, which is which is interesting. Um, so we have so thanks for that. And we have Graham. You're our last speaker. You have three minutes, but if you take four, I think that will be just fine. <laughs> thank you, Nancy. That means I won't have a chance to say thank you for organizing this group. Uh, <laughs> kudos to you. Uh, it's terrific, and I'm delighted to see the outreach that is being spawned by this forum. So uh, when Nancy approached me, I said, well, you know, I really don't feel that I'm the most appropriate person to talk about volunteer activity because the group was really conceived, I think, to be a form of outreach and connect emeriti with the community and my own volunteering has been much closer to home. Uh, but I want to make a pitch for the fact that volunteer work can be done with the Emeritus College. And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean full-time commitment and uh, a sort of unbreakable chain to the organization by becoming a senior officer as a principal or anything like that, but running special interest groups, contributing in any number of ways to the Emeritus College, 
is, I think, a really important close to home form of volunteering. And I hope that people will take that on as well as think about volunteering in the community. So uh, in my volunteering in the community, I suppose more broadly is uh, following on from Paul, uh, something that evolved pretty much by happenstance. Uh, I'm going to talk only about a couple of things. Uh, my volunteering in some ways, I suppose, taps into the skills I had, small as they are, as an academic, uh, research and writing and administration. Uh, so the first thing I'll talk about is a little gig that I fell into, well, was persuaded to uh, take on, cajoled, had my arm twisted to take on. Uh, way back in ancient times, I attended a naval college in Britain uh, for a variety of reasons. I didn't actually go to sea. Uh, I never had very much contact with the Old Boys Association uh, through 50 years, but they were having what they billed as a final reunion uh, of the, the college because it closed in 1968 while we were in England. So I thought it might be interesting to go along. Uh, at that gathering, I was outed as a professor, and uh, once they discovered that there was a professor in the midst of all of these old sailors, uh, they figured that professors might be able to research and write, so I had my arm twisted to become the obituary writer for the old college magazine. And so for the last three, four years now, I have been writing short obituaries 500 words or so uh, on people. I'm informed of their deaths. I do some research about their careers in various ways, mostly through the internet, a few other sources. And I produce these little spiels, which seem to be quite widely uh, appreciated. And uh, it is actually fascinating to find out what a group of motley people from various backgrounds ended up doing with their lives. To date, I've written about 120, 130 of these things. Uh, it's a, a business that shows few signs at the moment of slowing. Uh, in fact, when I approached a relative of one of the deceased for information, his response was to congratulate me in the middle of COVID in finding a business that was likely to continue expanding. Uh, anyway, it does continue to grow. So that's one thing that I have been doing, and even, well, closer to home, I suppose, my somewhat dubious administrative skills, I have put to use by serving on the advisory board for an online publication called BC Review, uh, which reviews books on British Columbia. Uh, it is, uh, because it's online, uh, pretty free and open to lengthier ruminations and reflections rather than the kind of standard 750 word book review. And it is run on a shoestring uh, by an individual who I used to work with at one stage. So we created an advisory board to assist him and offer advice and, and generally help to promote the organization. I have become de facto uh, chair of that advisory board, thinking now about succession plans and the like of that. But I do think that BC Review is a very useful contribution to the community. Uh, I write occasional reviews uh, for them and try and make a contribution in that way. But uh, the point I wanted to make was that I felt that I could do something to help out locally in the background with this advisory board and I hope that the consequence of that is that BC Review continues for some years to provide the, the information and the platform uh, to encourage informed citizenship, basically, in British Columbia. So those are the two main things that occupy my time. I have often thought that when I get less busy from being principal of the college, from trying to finish a book, I would like to look at doing something more orthodox in the way of volunteering, such as serving on a board and so on. And uh, Carol, since my work is in uh, environmental history and uh, environmental 
issues. Uh, SPEC is certainly one of the, the groups that I'm aware of and know something about. And um, sorry, I couldn't get to your meeting this morning. I was otherwise involved in a Zoom call, but uh, I'm just really gratified that there is so much commitment and activity that is spreading out from the Emeritus College into the community. And Carol Lynn uh, picking up the reverberations of that in Calgary, I think, is, is another example of the way in which the Emeritus College is really an organization with enormous potential. And so enough. Thank you, Nancy. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. This is a great way to end this absolutely magnificent session. This has been my favorite so far. I'm just so inspired by what everyone has to say. And I'm thrilled, Anne, that you are here and that you are hearing the valuable role that the Ameritire are playing in the local and global communities. Um, and I think we need to take this to the next level. Uh, I, I love the fact that you're here, Carolyn. And, and that we're, you know, we're known in, in Calgary and that if we could spread this, the volunteer network across the, the nation, that would be fantastic. Not just for advertising for the Emeritus College, it's really to create these networks. I mean, just this conversation you just had right now about SPEC, that's exactly what this is, is trying to do. Um, so I want to thank all of you so much. Just to remind you, February 23rd is the YWCA and Megaphone. Um, so hope to see you all there. And um, yeah, until then. Stay safe and healthy. Great to see you all. Bye-bye.